It was said that he sold his soul to the devil and made a pact with the lesser gods of the Okija shrine in order to gain wealth. Some people claim that the devil made a deal with him that in exchange for immersed wealth and longevity, he would have to bring his wife, mother, father or children. But it was said that Ezegu took the second option. Rather than bring his wife, mother, father or children in exchange for money, he decided to trade his own life. Abundant wealth was what he got, but long life was something that had to be compromised. That is, in exchange for wealth, he would have to die young, which may have been the reason he died mysteriously on the same day as his birthday, the 25th of December 1999 under a very unusual circumstances at just the age of 36. This is a controversial story of popular billionaire Victor Okafor, popularly known as Ezego of Inyala. Victor Okafor, popularly known by his title as Ezegu, which means the king of money, was at some point in Nigerian history the youngest millionaire, all the way from Inyala in Anambra State. At just 25 years old. This was during the late 80s all through the 90s. It was said that Victor started off as an armed robber but got in trouble with the law several times which prompted his father to kick him out of his house and then he eventually traveled to his grandmother's village in Umudru. But things were hard in Umudru and suddenly he decided to move to Lagos. Now just barely one year in Lagos this young man became a millionaire from nowhere which got everyone questioning his wealth like how how did this school dropout and former armed robber become a millionaire out of nowhere just like his death which we would talk about in a moment is a good source of wealth is as mysterious as it gets an entire debate on its own the first school of thought will tell you that he dealt with the devil at okija shrine where he made a pact to trade his life to gain wealth for a short period of time just so that he could save his family and live a better life for them after he had passed. But is that the real fact? Was his wealth really from the infamous Okija shrine? Did he really sacrifice half of his life for a limited amount of time filled with wealth and luxury? There is a second school of thought who find this idea that Ezegu's source of wealth was from a fetish source as BS. This school of thoughts believe that nothing about Ezegu's source of wealth was fetish. However, they agree it wasn't all that claim. It wasn't the purest of sources at first because it was said that when he got to Lagos, he started off as a scammer, which is the present day 419 or the present day Yahoo boy. But the kind of scam that was said that he did was this advanced payment type of scam where he would have to make someone pay in advance for something that he had probably shown them to buy. And from then, he would most likely take the money. That type of scam is the type you play with people who want to buy properties, lands, houses, cars. You make their pay in advance after showing them the product and from there you just you know take the money and they don't get to see anything so those were the kind of scam that was said that Ezego played on people when he went to lagos which gave him a lot of money now that was not all his source of wealth like this school of thought believes they believe that after he had scammed these people he took the money and invested it in really good businesses which later became a major source of his immersed wealth. He had a major electronic supply line of business that had branches both in Lagos and Abuja. He also had businesses that dealt with building materials and a functioning real estate firm that dealt with houses both in Abuja, Lagos and his hometown. His electronics showroom was said to be one of the largest at the time that had some of the newest inventions then back in the late 80s and early 90s. So electronics at the time was a big deal like the economy was good, there were so many people who were rich and the amount of people selling advanced electronics were not so much and Ezegu was said to be one of the largest supplier of modern electronics at the time. So invariably with this line of businesses, he was bound to be a millionaire. There was no doubt. Although it was very reasonable for people to question the equivalent of his wealth to that of his businesses, the caliber of properties that Ezegu owned, the caliber of houses that this man built across the country was so intensive and impressive that people were like, is this man really getting his money from just selling electronics in Lagos and Abuja? This man bought cars, fleets of cars. He was a lover of cars. 
and he bought them in dollars and kept them in his garage. He had numerous cars in his hometown in Hiala. He had tons of other cars back in Lagos where he lived with his family at the time. And as if those cars were not enough, the caliber of houses this man built across the country and even outside the country was something that made people's mouths drop. In one particular house, it was said he built it mostly out of glass, bulletproof glass to be specific. Now keep in mind this was the 90s and 80s in Nigeria, so it's like, where do you find a house made out of bulletproof glass all through? This man was clearly ahead of his time. And the installation of these glasses cost millions in dollars and it was said that it was even foreigners who came all the way from their home country to Anambra state in Hela to fix these glasses in his house. Ezegu was addressed as a millionaire but there was a very high chance that this man was a billionaire. With the caliber of properties he owned, it was not unusual for people to question whether or not the amount of money he gets from his business could actually afford him that kind of a lifestyle. And for what it was worth, people saw that it wasn't really telling. I mean, don't get me wrong, selling electronics and having different line of businesses could make you rich. But how rich could it make you? This man was swimming in wealth so much wealth that people could not just comprehend. It was this excessive show of wealth that made people begin to wonder. Maybe he really did have an affiliation with the Okija Shrine because clearly his businesses wouldn't have made him that rich in such a short period of time. However, the second school of thought still maintained that is in relation to measuring his businesses with the caliber of properties that he owned. The second school of thought believes that in as much as Isaku had businesses, he still had his hands in 419 scams, which was the origin of his wealth in the beginning. So it wasn't as though that when he did his first line of scamming people and invested in these businesses, it wasn't as though he stopped. So the second school of thoughts were of the opinion that he may have continued scamming people despite having lines of businesses which may have resulted in the immense wealth and caliber of properties that this man was able to afford at the time. And personally it kind of made sense because currently when we see present day Yahoo boys they tend to max their source of wealth which is the Yahoo with other forms of activity that they do to claim that that is where they get their source of money. So maybe Ezegu's businesses were just there to hide the fact that he was also a scammer or a 419. I mean, it's more convenient to believe it than to believe that he went to a shrine to sell half of his life for immersed wealth. I mean, if, if that was very possible, I think many people would have probably done it. Or maybe many people did it and he just did it differently. However, the problem with the second school of thought that believe that is a good source of wealth is genuine, although illegal and not related to some fetish shrine from Enugu, is the sudden death of this man himself. I mean, it's one thing to question his wealth, is wanting to make meaning out of it, is wanting to explain it and say, yeah, it's not from a fetish source, it's from a real genuine source but illegal source still but it's another thing for the controversy surrounding his death to just happen all of a sudden and people are like wow okay how do this second school of thought explain this because the way Ezegu died was so mysterious and unusual and suspicious that made people began to really see it that this man's source of wealth might have not really been the purest. In fact, his death made it all make sense. But before we continue, make sure you like this video. Please take a moment to like this video and also make a comment too. Let me know what you think towards the end of the video. And if you haven't subscribed, please do well to click the subscribe button and also turn on your notification button so whenever there is a new video, you will get notified. Before his death, he was known to always visit his hometown in Hiala, in Anambra State, every Christmas to his people. And it was said that his people always looked forward to seeing him every Christmas. In fact, they held a carnival 
expecting his return so whenever he lands in the village you will see a lot of masquerades children women men singing and dancing behind his vehicle as he sprays money into the air this was the culture of Izego every Christmas in his hometown and it was also said that he would usually take a plane from Lagos to Enugu and from Enugu his convoy about six to seven cars already parked in his compound in Anambra state would be waiting for him at the airport to drive him and his family all the way to his house so that was his usual nature he would get to Lagos airport take to Enugu and from Enugu fleet of cars waiting for him to arrive and they all drive all the way to Ihala Anambra state and even if he was to also go by road because it's not every time he would use flight because sometimes at the time also the flights were having lots of hair crashes and plane crashes so sometimes whenever he wanted to use the road it was said he would also take his convoy all the way from Lagos straight to Anambra State but he would be driven by his personal driver while he sat at the back seat with his family enjoying the ride However, on the 23rd of December 1999, the day he was set to prepare for his journey to his hometown for another year of the Christmas holiday, it was said that he first visited Fela Shrine in Lagos in hopes and prayers that his journey would go well. Now, it's important to understand that Fela Shrine was not exactly a fetish kind of shrine. It was just a name given to a musical club that was, you know, modeled after the lifestyle or the style of music popular nigerian singer fela kuti sang so the fela shrine was not exactly a fetish native doctor shrine where they kill goats and do blood sacrifices it was just a place people called fela shrine people go there to drink eat listen to live bands and you know it is dedicated to the late fela and so that is why they call it the fela shrine so that's as far as I know about Fela Shrine, but I guess it might be totally different for people who are personally familiar with it. So after his visit to Fela Shrine, he embarked on his journey with a six convoy vehicle. Now, like we've already mentioned, usually whenever he was traveling by road, his driver would drive him while he would sit on any one of the vehicles in the convoy. However, on this particular day, on this particular trip, it was said that Ezegu decided to drive himself in one of the vehicles. Everyone in the convoy, including his family members, thought it was strange. It had never happened before. So why did this man all of a sudden, after so many years of him being driven to his home, decide that he wanted to drive? But they couldn't argue with him. He was the boss and of course, they let him drive. Another odd thing was in the vehicle he chose to drive. It was said that he asked that nobody shared the vehicle with him. Now it's unclear whether or not his family members was also in the travel journey but some sources said that he had his family members traveling with him but they were in their own individual vehicle which was said to be unusual in previous trips because he would actually sit with his families or friends or people around him but on this day it was said that he said he was going to drive by himself and that nobody else would be in the vehicle the one that he was occupying with him which again was odd but i mean who was going to argue with him he was the boss wasn't he and so the journey began with him in his cherokee jeep but then somewhere in ibadan expressway it was said that the jeep began to malfunction as though the engine was having an issue and as though it was overheating however the jeep did not break down until they got to asaba which was basically four to five hours away from lagos it was said that when they got to Asaba, the jeep completely broke down. And in a bid to save time, he ordered one of the people with him to get a chain so they could tow the jeep all the way to Inyala. At first, he wanted to leave it there to have a mechanic come fix it and, you know, bring it all the way later to him. I mean, that was an option. He could easily have told one of his boys, which he had many, to stay with the vehicle till it's fixed while he continued his journey. But it was said that he was scared of the vehicle being stolen. Don't forget this man really loved his cars. So it's understandable to see why he was afraid that his vehicle would get stolen. That was why he asked that the vehicle be towed along with them on their way to the village. And this is where the next strange thing happened. You would think since he was going to tow the vehicle, one of the vehicles where 
his friends and family and employees were driving would be the vehicle to tow this broken down jeep. It was said that Izugu was the one who offered to occupy another vehicle in the line of convoy and that vehicle that he was going to occupy would still be the vehicle to tow the broken vehicle. Now this clearly doesn't make sense. For such a high status man who had numerous employees that he could easily employ to do that job, it was strange to think that he offered to tow his own vehicle while all his other employees and drivers were driving their own individual vehicles and not bothering anyone. I mean, nothing stopped him from actually driving another vehicle all by himself, but did he have to tow the broken down vehicle by himself? Well, that was what happened. So it was said that he got into another vehicle and had the broken jeep hooked to that vehicle he was now driving and asked someone to be in it to, you know, direct it while he towed it along with the other four to five cars following behind. Now they eventually passed Asaba. It was when they were getting so close to Nyala, two kilometers from his village, just around Onichade, that the worst suddenly just happened. Now it's not clear what really happened or how the accident instantly happened, but it was said that Ezegu spotted a pothole and immediately stepped on the brake. Now when he stepped on the brake, all of a sudden, the vehicle he was said to be towing eventually hit his own vehicle from the back, causing him to roll into a dish by the side of the road. Now, some account had it that the chain in which he used to connect the vehicle he was now driving with the broken jeep was what broke apart causing him to roll over in a dish. Meanwhile, some sources claim that when he stepped on the brake, the person driving the towed vehicle did not have enough time to step on his own brake and thereby hitting Ezego's vehicle which caused Ezego to roll into a dish. Immediately, it was total chaos seeing Ezego's car roll into a dish, causing everyone to panic and by the time they got him out of that dish and the vehicle, he had a very deep gash to his face, as though his face was broken apart. Some people described it as really horrifying because he was a very handsome man but that gash really disfigured his face, causing it to swell immediately. It was said they rushed into a hospital instantly, ironically, a hospital he had once contributed millions of naira into, our ladies of Lord's Hospital. But unfortunately for him, the hospital was still under-equipped and his family members decided that they'd take him to Port Harcourt to get adequate treatment. So this is where the story began to get really hazy. Some account had it that it was on his way to Port Harcourt that he eventually passed on along the road, while some said he got to Port Harcourt and was offered to be transferred to Lagos and that it was on his way to Lagos that he died. However, the day of his death would be recorded to be the 26th of December. 1999. Now, Izegu's sudden behavior the day he died was what caused the speculation or was what worsened the fire that was already burning regarding the source of his wealth. I mean, if people kept making excuses that his wealth had no fetish connection, why was all these things happening? Why did he suddenly decide to drive his car by himself? Why did his car break down and he decided to tow it himself, knowing that he had too many people he could employ, he had so many people he could pay? To do that job for him. People began to suspect that maybe he knew he was going to die, maybe he saw it coming and didn't want anyone else to be involved and that was why he chose not to let any of his family members join him in the vehicle. Almost similar to the claim that when he was asked to bring his wife, mother, father or children in exchange for wealth and long life, he chose to give himself instead. I mean, this was clear that Ezegu might have really valued and loved his family. That is, if it's true that his wealth was affiliated with the Okija shrine, then clearly this man must have really loved his family. However, it actually only got worse from his death, which is making it difficult for the second school of thought who believes that his wealth and every fetish thing around him was just a coincidence to even make a point. Because even after his death, he would think every other thing would rest. However, his death was the beginning of another set of crises, which unraveled another side of the controversy that left many people certain for a fact that this man's source of wealth was definitely powered by the prowess of the infamous Okija shrine. Or was it not?
After Ezegu died, people began to talk, people began to connect one dot to another, people began to read meanings to everything, why he died on his birthday, why he chose to drive by himself, and why he died just close to Enugu area and Onicha area and just close to his hometown. However, things became worse when it was time to read his will. It was said that the lawyer who was supposed to read his will was eventually attacked and assassinated in a very brutal manner. Now, after Ezegu died, his lawyer, Barnabas Igwe, was said to be the one in charge to read his will to his family to know who is inheriting what and who is not. But it was said that the reading of Ezegu's will delayed for some unusual reason and the year and period of time that it was finally due for the lawyer to read his will, Mr. Barnabas Igwe was attacked along with his wife. Abigail, who was also a lawyer, on their way coming from a party, it was said that they were blocked and stopped by a group of guys who wore masks and they were macheted, cut into pieces like pieces of meat, till they died. Even Abigail Igwe was said to have been pregnant at the time and it was said that she begged the assailant to spare her because of her unborn child, but the killers did not spare her life. It was said that she died at the spot, but Barnabas had the time to, you know, still speak after being rushed to the hospital in which he revealed who he thought killed him but you know for some reason Barnabas Igwe's death is another controversial story on its own that had to do with the politics and the politicians at the time which made people believe that the person Barnabas had accused of killing him did it so that he could have a take at Ezego's wealth those were the rumors at the time the governor of Anambra state at the time was the one believed to have had a hand in Barnabas Igwe's assassination. He was even taken to court for it, although he was discharged and found not guilty, but people began to connect the dots and assume that the reason why Barnabas was killed was so that the governor at the time would have access to Ezegu's wealth. And the final straw that breaks the back to the controversy surrounding Ezegu's source of wealth is the fact that after he died, his mansion in Inhala Anambra state was totally abandoned. Today, his mansion is a shadow of itself. His cars that were valued at thousands of dollars at the time have all been abandoned. His palace is officially just a place for sightseeing and people are so afraid of even stealing anything from that compound because of the omen and belief that all this wealth were affiliated with the Okija shrine, built with blood money built with blood sacrifices which is why even when people go to his house currently they barely take anything which is unusual for nigerians because definitely with such a wealthy house like that if it was open to the public people would go there and steal a lot of things but all his properties his cars his his houses his shares his sofas are still intact are still the way they left it many years ago because people are so afraid of taking anything because they think it's affiliated with the Okija Shrine. Even his businesses and establishments, wherever they were, all crumbled and vanished, gone with the wind, as though they never existed. So what does this mean? Does this really mean that Ezegu's source of wealth was something to be questioned? Or is this all just a coincidence? The second school of thought, however, believes that Ezegu's source of wealth was as genuine and illegal as it was, but it still wasn't fetish. They believed the reason why his wealth depreciated, the reason why people deserted his properties, the reason why people could not steal from his houses whenever they went to visit is because of the rumors and impressions and connotations spread by the lies that people have made to associate his wealth with the Okija Shrine, which honestly makes sense. I mean, when everybody begins to think that certain thing is fetish and is of the devil, it's going to make people not want to go near it. It's going to make people not want to touch it. And coming from a country that is so religious, I understand why people would actually not associate themselves with his properties because they've been told it is from a shrine. So which school of thought do you fall into? Do you believe is a good source of wealth was fetish? Or do you believe people were just overreacting that his source of wealth might have been illegal but it was so far from being fetish and the controversy surrounding his death was only just a coincidence it could have happened to anybody i mean accidents do happen doesn't it so that's it guys let me know what you think about this Ezogu story 
I would like to also know your thoughts. Do you think his source of wealth was purely illegal but not fetish or do you think his source of wealth was purely illegal but still very much fetish? Let me know what you think and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed by now. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time on my channel.